Our next speaker is Rodolfo Gambini from Uruguay, from the University of uh, La Republic. Okay. It is a pleasure to participate in, in this conference about <clears throat> quantum foundations. <clears throat> I will talk today about an approach to the measurement problem based on a quantum gravitational notion of time. I will start uh, with an outline of the talk. I will present uh, the orthodox view of the measurement problem. I will analyze the role of time in general covariant theories and quantum mechanics. I will present a description of the evolution of quantum systems using a quantum notion of time. I will discuss quantum gravitational limits on the precision of physical clocks. I will recall uh, the environmental decoherence program in the measurement problem. And I will propose a solution of measurement problem using physical clocks. I will finish with some philosophical considerations. Well, uh, the problem of measurements in quantum mechanics arise in standard treatments as the requirement of a reduction process when a measurement takes place. Such process is not contained within the unitary evolution of the quantum theory, but this has to be postulated externally and it is not unitary. Reduction is usually justified through the coherence due to the interaction of a large measuring device with an environment with many degrees of freedom. Objections have been raised onto two aspects of the solution of the problem of measurement through the coherence. In first place, since the evolution of the system plus environment is unitary, the coherence persists when the environment is included and it could potentially be observed or regained by observing the environment. And the second criticism has to do with the fact that in a picture where evolution is unitary, nothing ever occurs. This is the bell and or problem. The final reduced density matrix of the system plus the measurement device will describe a set of coexistent options and not of alternative options with definite probabilities. We shall discuss in first place the issue of time in general equivalent systems and propose a solution uh, for this issue. The problem of time in totally constrained systems like general relativity is the following. The system is completely described by a set of constraints. In the case of general relativity, the constraints are uh, part of the Einstein equations and the other equations are consistency conditions. And the constraints are defined first uh, class uh, our first class, that is the Poisson brackets of two constraints, weakly vanishes, that is vanishes on the uh, constraint surface. The generator of the evolution also generate a gauge transformation because the Hamiltonian may be written as a linear combination of the constraints. Uh, Rodolfo? Yes. Eh, we, no estamos viendo nada más que la, la primera slide. ¿Es, ¿Está bien eso? O? No. Estoy mostrando. I, I, I'm showing the, the second one. We can only see the first one. Now? No. Q. 
quizás se deja de compartir y vuelve a compartir, pero cuando comparta, compartir el escritorio, o sea, toda, toda la pantalla, no solo las slides. Quizás ahí te va a dejar. Ok, ahora... Sí, ahora sí. Que, que mueva, a ver. A ver. Perfecto. Ay, así, ahora sí. Ok. Then, uh, I continue with the, the, the same slide. I was talking about the general covariance systems. General covariance systems uh, are such that the Hamiltonian is a linear combination of the constraints. And... In the case of general relativity, constraints are first class and weekly, the, the Poisson bracket weekly vanishes. Observables are gauge invariant quantities, and therefore the Poisson bracket with the constraint vanishes. And as the Hamiltonian is a linear combination of the constraint, the, the observables commute with the Hamiltonian. And therefore they are constant of the motion. Only Dirac observables can be quantized in the space where the constraints are fulfilled, called the physical space. We live in a general covariant universe where all the observable magnitudes are constant. Then uh, we, we have the, the issue of time. If the physically relevant quantities in totally constrained systems as general relativity are constant of the motion, how can we describe the evolution? There are several proposals for the description of the evolution. The first one is well known, it's the gauge fixing. You, uh, one introduces a classical parameter that plays the role of time, but I, I'm calling the parameter tau. And one assumes that certain function in the kinematical space is equal to this parameter. For instance, for a free particle, the Q0 is equal to tau and quantize the gauge fix uh, theory. In this case, where the, the time will be a classical variable. And you quantize, uh, you quantize after choosing the time. There is a second proposal known and, as the uh, evolving observables that was proposed by Barman, DeWitt, and Robelli, among others. And, consists in the following. You consider a one parameter family of observables that is of quantities that have vanishing Poisson bracket with the constraint. And these observables are such that when one of the variables of the system, in this case, Q1, takes the value of the parameter, then this observable takes the value of another kinematical variable of the space. Let me uh, discuss an, an example. For instance, for rel the relativistic particle, you have here the constraint. You have two Dirac observables, the, the momentum and the position, the initial position of the system. And you may define an uh, evolving observable that is this quantity <coughs> that depends on T. Notice that when t is equal to q0, then this term cancels with this, and you recover the position at this time. But one needs to assume that there are variables as q0 that are physically observable, even though they are not Dirac observables. To know when the measurement is carried out, we need to observe a case-dependent quantity. And this is a problem in this approach. There is a third proposal that consists in, con in considering conditional probabilities. The idea is that one promotes all variables to quantum operators and computes conditional probabilities among them. For totally constrained system, this approach also ran into problem which variables to promote as a clock? Dirac observables are of 
no use because they are constant. Pace and Wouters propose using kinematical variables. And recently, Helen Smith and Locke have shown that it is possible to use kinematical variables in a consistent way. But again, you are using quantities that are not observable in the physical space. In any of these approach, one encounters the same problem. The evolution can only be described in terms of an ideal, essentially classical time. This is the type of time used in the Schrodinger equation. There is an, uh, a solution to, to this problem that allows to use physical clocks, that is clocks that obeys the laws of quantum mechanics and general relativity, like the ones in our universe. We will elaborate on that and propose a solution where all reference to external parameter is abolished and the evolution is defined in terms of correlation between Dirac observables. First, one choose an evolving observable as the clock, let us call it capital T, and then one identifies the set of observables O1 until ON that commute with T and describe the physical system whose evolution one wants to study. And one, com one computes a conditional probability, the conditional probability that having observed T in certain interval, you will observe O in certain interval. This conditional probability is given as a quotient of the simultaneous probability of measuring T and Q or O divided by the probability of measuring T. Notice that the parameter T is associated to a variable used to define the evolving observables that as we have discussed, is not uh, associated with any observable quantity, but with a kinematical quantity. And we consider that this variable is an ideal and observable quantity. And due to that, one integrates over all the possible values of T. We have shown that this definition leads to the correct propagator plus quantum corrections But the Schrodinger evolution is modified. There is a crucial difference with the standard evolution that can only be neglected if one uses an ideal clock where T and capital T are perfectly correlated quantities. If it, this is not the case, the Schrodinger evolution is modified and you have an evolution where the uh, you have additional terms. The first two terms describe the evolution of the density matrix uh, when they obey Schrodinger equation, but you have an additional term proportional to the rate of spread of the wave function of the clock. Recall that we are considering quantum clocks. That is clocks uh, as an atomic clock. The evolution is given by a master equation of the Lindblad type and pure states evolve into mixed states. The use of physical clocks required by a quantum gravitational description of time induces a fundamental loss of unitarity unless it is possible to define a perfect clock. This loss of coherence <clears throat> has been observed, for instance, in radio oscillations People have conjectured that there are limitations in clock precision in a, in a quantum gravitational system. As we do not have a complete theory of quantum gravity, this is a contentious issue. Phenomenological arguments have been given by Salek and Wigner, you, Caroliasi, Lloyd, Frenkel, leading to similar limitations based on two main effects, quantum fluctuations and black hole formation. We have recently 
given a simple, a, a, a simple argument leading to a fundamental minimum uncertainty in the determination of time intervals consistent with the previous estimation. It only relies in the uncertainty in principle between time and energy and in time dilation in a gravitational field. And the result is the following. The uncertainty in the measurement of a time interval is always greater than the power one third of the time interval we are measuring times the power two thirds or of the uh, Planck time and something similar with the lengths. This, uh, when the, the quality holds, then you have the best accuracy than one, one can get. And with, with this accuracy, the solution of the master equation I have shown in the previous slide takes this form. The first two factors correspond to uh, the standard evolution, but there is a correction which is a damping factor proportional to the power two thirds of the interval and the uh, square of the Bohr frequencies. And therefore the, the density matrix uh, decoheres and tend to take a diagonal form. And pure states evolve into statistical mixtures and the out of diagonal terms of the density matrix asymptotically vanish and the system would present a fundamental loss of coherence due to these effects. These effects together with the standard environmental decoherence allow solving the problem of measurement. I, I, I have to say that this is a very small corrections or between the, because of this power of four thirds of the Planck time. Let us record what is the standard scenario of environmental decoherence. A quantum system interacting with an environment with many degrees of freedom will give the appearance that the initial quantum coherence of the system is lost. For instance, for a two-level measuring device, let us assume that the density matrix of the device initially is in a pure state, psi. With uh, this state is equal to a linear combination of the two basis element in the two-dimensional space. After interacting with the environment, the reduced density matrix of the device takes the form given here, which is quasi-diagonal. The first two terms correspond to the diagonal terms, and the uh, last two terms correspond to the coherences. And here appears a factor z, that is the product of os oscillatory terms with different uh, frequencies corresponding to the different couplings of the measuring device with the environment. This uh, factor vanish uh, after a decoherence time because the cancellation of the different uh, oscill oscillatory terms and the measuring device takes an almost diagonal form. This is usually interpreted in the, in the sense that then uh, one gets for the measuring device something that is very similar to what one obtain after a, a measurement. But the problem is that the measuring device is still coupled with the environment. And the interference terms are still present in the environment. The total system is still in a pure state after the coherence, and coherence can be, in principle, be revealed by measuring a suitable observable of the total system, including the environment. A second problem is revivals are present in closed systems, according to Poincaré's recurrence theorem. After a very long time, the off diagonal terms become large again. And the out of diagonal terms of the density matrix will recover the initial value. This is called the problem of revivals or recurrence of coherence or recoherence. 
Both problems are solved by the combined effect of the fundamental decoherence induced by real clocks and the fundamental bounds induced by quantum and gravitational effects to the measurement of time intervals and distances. Due to the fundamental decoherence induced by quantum clocks, the expectation value of the observables of the complete system, including the measuring device and the environment, differ from one obtained when an event occurs by an exponentially vanishing quantity. A similar analysis allows to show that revivals are also prevented by the modified evolution. When the multiperiodic function in the coherence tend to take again the original value, the exponential decay due to the evolution with real clocks, given by this last factor, completely hides the revival under the noise amplitude. Finally, the previously mentioned fundamental bounds in space and time uh, measurements prevent distinguishing between exponentially small differences. When the fundamental bounds for measurement of time intervals and distances are taken into account, the final state of the measurement device coupled to the environment rigorously coincides with an exact statistical mixture. In other words, the final state represents a set of possible outcomes with their corresponding probabilities. If an event occurs in a statistical mixtures, the conditional probabilistic predictions about the future behavior of the system are not perturbed by the production of the event, and the evolution is always described by the same master equation. We have shown that in a quantum gravitational universe, the states evolve into statistical mixtures, and therefore it is possible to explain why events take place in measurement devices without any violation of the equation of motion. We don't need to consider two different types of evolution as the, in the standard formulation. <clears throat> Notice that the previous analysis tell us when events may occur, it does not provide an explicit mechanism for the selection of one of the possible outcomes. Our point of view about this problem is that when the state of a system takes the form of a statistical mixture, events occur. This statement could be considered as an ontological postulate in the role of physics to predict when the events can occur and with which probability they occur. The Montevideo interpretation determines the condition that a quantum system should satisfy for random choice to occur, leading to instantiation of new events, represented by projectors in the Hilbert space and their probability. It explains how and when a definite reality appears at the macroscopic level. This criterion transcends the measurement process and applies to the production of events in a macro system it is completely objective uh, and do not require the intervention of any observer. I will conclude with uh, some philosophical considerations. If the fundamental nature of the world is quantum mechanical and we adopt an interpretation that provides a criterion for the occurrence of events, we are led to an ontology of objects and events. Based on this ontology, objects, I'm speaking about atoms, crystals, or cells, and events can be considered the building blocks of reality. Objects will be represented in the quantum formalism by system in certain states. An object is characterized by its disposition to produce events in certain environments for instance, to produce a click in a Geiger counter. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was observed that an ontology of events allow us to face the problem of consciousness in a promising way. The philosophical current called neutral monism basically maintains that events can be associated with physical aspects as well as phenomenal aspects like feeling or sensations. The physical aspects result when we access to them from the outside, as we do in our laboratories. The phenomenal aspect will result from the first person access, like the one we would have in our brains. The sensations would then be a particular class of events to which we have direct access. 
Throughout his life, Bertrand Russell adopted different positions close to neutral monism. For instance, in 1927, he said, matter in a given place are all the events that are there. And he goes on to say that such vision of matter implies that we do not have to deal anymore with what used to be mysterious about the causal theory of perception. I think that an ultimate scientific account of what goes on in the world will resemble psychology rather than physics. I think that if our scientific knowledge were adequate to the task, it would state the causal laws of the world in terms of particular events, not, not in terms of matter. Causal laws so stated would, I believe, be applicable to psychology and physics equally. Can quantum mechanics help to understand the problem of consciousness? Briefly, there exist three reasons for considering that quantum mechanics may help to explain conscious phenomena. Randomness, that is the fundamental role of the production of events uh, in the production of events have uh, free and cause choices of the system may help to explain the effectiveness of our mind in the determination of our actions. Ontology, the nature of the fundamental objects of the quantum theory that is more neutral towards the dichotomy between the material and the mental. And coherence and entanglement, the non-local properties like entanglement of the quantum state that give rise to top-down causation that could contribute to solve one of the central aspects of the hard problem of consciousness that consists in explaining the unified and componentless way in which conscious phenomena appear to us. However, it is not clear how quantum mechanics would contribute to understand consciousness in a, in a biological environment where the coherence occurs very quickly, like our brain. In fact, it is usually believed that in a biological system, the coherence would destroy long-range quantum effects. This was shown, for instance, by Max Deckmark in uh, the year 2000. However, during the last decades, several biological processes where quantum mechanics plays a, cru a crucial role have been discovered. Photosynthesis, spin-dependent magnetic sensibility, the avian compass, DNA mutations, fluorescent proteins, ion channels. All these processes uh, are discussed in the nice book by McFadden and Al-Khalili life on the edge. And in the year 2015, a model for quantum consciousness was proposed by Fisher. It is based in a mechanism for entangled macroscopic microsystems protected from the coherence effects based on the nuclear spins of the phosphorus belonging to Posner molecules that have this form. This molecule can protect the qubits of the phosphorus nuclei from the coherence of very long times, allowing the formation of entangled systems of many particles and thereby serving as a working quantum memory capable of interacting with a neural system. Effects on the nuclear spins on the behavior were first observed in lithium isotopes. There, uh, it is well known that lithium have uh, properties uh, on the psychis uh, of human beings and other animals. Uh, and different isotopes have different effects and this, they have this exactly the same uh, chemical properties and the difference only lies in the nucleus. And this led uh, Fisher to this idea. We have discussed that in a recent paper, an empirical verification of the existence of quantum processes in our brain would allow to put the issue of consciousness on empirical basis. I conclude mentioning a couple of uh, works, one paper and a book. 
Um, thank you very much. I don't know. Okay. Thank you, Rodolfo, for your talk. If somebody has a question or comment, uh, please say. Olympia Lombardi. Thank you, Rodolfo, for the interesting talk about time. It's something very interesting, always very interesting. I, I want to know if I understood rightly or not the the how do you construct the um, the time operator? You construct the time operator. Yes, you, it's very at the very beginning. Yes. Uh, because then everything yeah. runs very well, but I, I yes, first, I, that, that one. So yeah. the, that, that one is a function of small t. That small t cannot be a parameter, parameter external parameter. Right. It, right. it needs right. to be a, 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 a var, var, variable, a, some, some variable that is not observable. Right. My question is, uh, in what sense, I mean, in what extent, this can be uh, compatible with the relational um, construction of patient waters or of Rovelli? Because they, they are taking a, that, this idea of taking of, of defining a, a small t relationally, like a variable, yes, any variable. I mean, and this is a, a step further, you define an, a, an operator. Yes. Big T. I mean, but this can be made uh, compatible with that uh, kind of uh, constructions, or, or there is something very, um, I mean, different from the very essence. No, the, there is something very different. The 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 T may be any any variable. You may consider, for instance, you may describe the the, the evolution of a particle using another particle as your clock, the position of another particle as a clock. In this case, the capital T will be the position of the second particle. Mm. And T would be this, uh, this an, an observable parameter. It is important to, to choose the small t in such a way that the evolution is, uh, is uh, um, pre preserve uh, the, the, the is constant, the, the rate of evolution is constant. This is always possible to do. And this was, this was the basis of the solution proposed by Hen and the other people to the original uh, proposal by Page and Wouters. Because the proposal by Page and Wouters, in fact, uh, doesn't work uh, because the, they don't get the, the correct propagators. But it is possible to make sense of this proposal using kinematical variables. And this was done very recently, uh, the last year, by these Austrian people. But here, I'm defining the conditional probabilities by this expression, where I consider the, the, the quotient between the simultaneous probability and the probability of measuring time. But the main difference is that I don't know what is the value of the ideal uh, and observable parameter small t. And then I need to integrate over all possible values. As t is uh, chosen such, in such a way that the, uh, the evolution has a constant rate, then the, the, the integration measure is simply one and uh, the definition works perfectly and this is the exact uh, result. We have proved that with this proposal, you recover the, uh, the standard propagator between two points uh, for a particle being in time T1 at a certain position and then at time T2 in a different position, you obtain the, the, the quantum mechanical propagator plus quantum correction and these quantum corrections are related with this additional term in the master equation. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have a question or? 
If there is time, yes. Do I have yes, time? We have uh, some minutes. Okay, yes, yes. I'll try to be quick. Uh, if I understood correctly, in this ontology, you have objects that can, can generate events. So if I understood correctly, these are essentially probabilistic. Uh, this is an essentially probabilistic interpretation and there are no hidden variables. If that's correct, I would like to know what you think about uh, the fact that there are some people that say that if you have a cosmological solution, like a classical solution to the Einstein equations, uh, you can like, look at the universe from the outside and everything is fixed. So you, you don't have a place there to uh, a non-deterministic or, non or uh, uh, fundamentally uh, probabilistic behavior. So uh, I would like to, to hear what's your take on that and if I make sense of what I'm saying. As I mentioned uh, here, what we have is that the evolution of the total system, including the environment, ends up uh, being in a in a statistical mixture. And we assume that when the system takes this form, then one of the elements of this mixture is instantiated in an analogous way of what happens in the modal interpretation. But here, only when the state takes this form, because when the state takes this form, they are statistical mixtures, nothing uh, modifies the evolution. You may always compute the conditional probabilities and the results are the same before and after the, the occurrence of, of the events. Simply you actualize the information if you uh, observe one of the possible outcomes of the system. Okay, I see, thanks, thanks. Okay. Uh, I have a little uh, question. Uh, do you need a um, special condition or like uh, intense gravity or something uh, to to that uh, this equation give a significant non-unitary effects or uh, this equation depends on the rate of spread of the wave function of the clock. We, we, we all, all the clocks we have have a rate of spread. But the question is if there is a fundamental bound and uh, quantum gravity suggests that this bound exists. And that was uh, what I discussed uh, with these inequalities. Uh -huh. And then uh, I use these inequalities in order to compute uh, or, or determine if uh, uh, um, a quantum system, a quantum measurement device uh, is possible uh, to have an evolution that ends up in a statistical mixture for uh, the measuring device. And the answer is positive with this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, if there is no another question, we thanks uh, to Rodolfo for your talk. Um,